Welcome to CUNY Laureates, the show about CUNY graduates who went on to win major awards in their respective fields. In this episode, we continue our Nobel series by profiling four City College graduates with a passion for the sciences. First, Leon Letterman's quest for simplicity ends in the discovery of one of the most elusive particles in the universe. From Tylenol to Prozac, we learn how Julius Axelrod's lab accident led to major advances in the pharmaceutical industry. Finally, Jerome Carl and Herbert Hoffman find perfect symmetries both in crystals and beyond. Remember the Big Bang? Apparently, this violent moment that started 13.5 billion years ago never really ended. In fact, we're still part of it. According to all accumulated knowledge so far, all the matter of the universe that was spewed out in that initial explosion is still being pushed outwards into the big unknown. Oh, did I mention forever? Sounds scary, right? Luckily for us, some scientists believe this process could be reversed if there was a gravitational force strong enough, or in other words, a mass big enough, to pull the universe back together. Yet as far as we know, even if we piled all the known massive objects in the universe together, we wouldn't have nearly enough mass to stop the universe from expanding. But what if we're looking in the wrong place? What if the answer to those massive questions lies in objects so small that they defy even our attempts to classify them as objects? This is the story of a CUNY graduate who became a Nobel laureate and the discovery of muon neutrinos. Leon's first taste of experimental research came at a very early age. His older brother, Paul, was an experimental scientist extraordinaire of his own design. He was a little wild, and that's why I guess he never finished high school, Leon later said. But he had magic hands, and he loved to rig up a laboratory of various things in the basement of our home and let me help him. It was there in his brother's improvised lab where Leon decided to become a chemist. The experiments Paul and he performed in the basement of their house offered a more predictable, simpler reality, something both of their parents had to fight to achieve. Escaping the Russian Revolution at the age of 12, their mother Mina reached New York Harbor with nothing but the name tag around her neck. Politically active during the last days of Imperial Russia, their father, Morris, was quick enough to be one jump ahead of Tsarist police. He later managed to flee his home country and eventually settled in the Bronx. Life in the New World was anything but simple. Both Morris and Mina had to work hard to earn their living and never got a proper education. But learning was revered in the family, and even though they didn't get to have it, they wanted their kids to have it. Leon joined City College at the height of the Great Depression. Originally enrolled as a chemistry student, Leon soon started using City College's many departments to satisfy his intellectual curiosity. It was here at the City College that he first learned about the ancient Greek philosophers and their quest to find the first principle of the universe. Their fundamental belief that logic and reason could be used to decipher reality appealed to Leon. And soon, he found himself immersed in the teachings of Democritus, the laughing philosopher, who postulated the existence of atoms, indivisible elementary particles that made up all the matter of the universe. Leon took several courses in physics, and in the next couple of years, started realizing that the seductive complexity of nature could be expressed in simpler, more fundamental terms, hopefully far away from the complex odors of a chemistry lab. After graduating from the City College in 1943, Leon decided to join the Army. Assigned to the Signal Corps branch, he became part of a team that developed Doppler radar, the device still used for weather forecasts and speeding violations. Three years later, after earning the rank of a second lieutenant, Leon returned to New York and started his graduate studies at Columbia University, this time studying physics. The post-World War II era and the rising fear of a possible nuclear conflict increased funding of scientific research. In an effort to advance the fields of nuclear and particle physics, 
Columbia University was using some of this funding to build their first particle accelerator in Irvington on the Hudson. By the early 30s, scientists had already confirmed the existence of subatomic particles, such as the electrons that form the outer layer of the atom, as well as the protons and the neutrons that, bound by nuclear forces, form the inner core of the atom, the nucleus. Now, it was time to dig even deeper and cut into the nuclei itself. Recognizing the potential of this effort, Leon decided to put his sharp mind to use and join the accelerator revolution. For the next 40 years, working on a number of major atom smashers, Letterman established himself as one of the leading names of particle physics and played an essential role in the creation of a theory that came to be known as the Standard Model. This new theory was created as part of the global scientific effort to describe elemental forces in the universe and classify all known elementary particles in one system. Unfortunately for Leon and his quest for simplicity, this system came to be anything but simple. Instead of one indivisible particle called the atom, the scientific community now had to deal with multiple groups of weird behaving particles, such as fermions and bosons, as well as subgroups like quarks and leptons, coming in what the scientists referred to as different flavors. And, in an ironic twist of fate, Leon had to prove the existence of the most elusive one of them. In 1962, working with his colleagues Melvin Schwartz and Jack Steinberger, Letterman set out to prove the existence of muon neutrinos, particles with no electric charge, no strong force, and no measurable mass. Dubbed ghost particles because of their almost non-existent qualities and the ability to pass through everything, neutrinos have been assumed to exist in huge quantities throughout the universe. In fact, it was assumed that trillions of them were passing through our bodies every second, yet catching one was no easy task. But using the alternating gradient synchrotron, the most powerful high-energy accelerator of the time, Leon and his colleagues managed to do just that. Inside the machine, a beam of protons was fired towards a 5,000-ton wall of steel. As the protons decayed into smaller particles, only the muon neutrinos were small enough to penetrate the steel wall and enter a highly specialized detector where their trails could be observed and photographed, proving the existence of the second flavor of neutrino. Proving the existence of distinct flavors of neutrinos didn't make the universe any simpler. Yet, just like Democritus's atoms, they did open another chapter in humanity's quest for knowledge. Leon's personal quest, however, was far from over. After working at the forefront of particle physics for more than 40 years, he got involved in science education policy. His deep commitment to promoting the importance of physics and education was matched only by his natural wit and humor that he so often used to make science more accessible to the general public. In 1988, Leon Letterman, the laughing scientist, received a Nobel Prize in physics for the neutrino beam method and the demonstration of the doublet structure, the leptons through the discovery of the muon neutrino. In his book, the God Particle, if the universe is the answer, what is the question? Leon Letterman gave a humorous yet profound account of the history of science and hinted that the solution to the mysteries of the universe may be closer than we think. Deciphering the true nature of the recently discovered Higgs boson, which he famously dubbed the God Particle, may help us understand the inner workings of mass and gravity, the last fundamental force the standard model has yet to explain. And with a single unified theory of the universe, perhaps we could one day even stop it from stretching us too thin. But as Leon Letterman learned the hard way, sometimes the quest for simplicity can get a little complicated. The place is New York City. A young lab assistant is working late into the night. 
He's trying to open a particularly stubborn container of concentrated pneumonia when disaster strikes. The pressure inside the bottle sends the ammonia spraying up into his face and his eyes. The caustic liquid burns with pain and his vision fails him. But inside of him, something else is happening. His body begins to release adrenaline, causing it to enter its fight or flight response. His heart rate goes up. Blood sugar levels begin to elevate. Blood flow to his muscles increases, giving him the burst of strength needed to fight off or run from this external threat. Everything in his body is now working towards a common goal, survival. Of course, this threat is neither human nor animal. There's nothing to fight off, and it's too late to flee. Instead, he is hospitalized in Bellevue, where he eventually recovers. Scarred but alive, he's out of harm's way. But what happened to the adrenaline that was released into his body? The neurotransmitter is no longer pushing his heart rate through the roof or giving him an unnatural burst of strength. Is it gone? And if so, where did it go? This is the story of the CUNY graduate who became a Nobel laureate and the discovery of reuptake. No, this isn't an image of a James Bond villain. No, it isn't, is it? No. Julius Axelrod's accident left him permanently blind in one eye, resulting in a unique choice of fashion. Born in 1912, Julius Axelrod was only 17 when the Great Depression hit New York City. Yet the stock market crash of 1929 was not nearly enough to dissuade young Julius from pursuing his dreams. That same year, he decided to try his luck at New York University in the hopes of later attending medical school. However, after a year of financial struggles, his money finally ran out and he decided to transfer to the tuition-free City College. Far more affordable to low-income students and open to those whom other schools discriminated against, the proletarian Harvard, as it was known at the time, proved to be a perfect fit for the child of Jewish immigrants. Inconveniently enough, the college was also known as the Harvard on the Hudson, and getting to it from the Lower East Side took a very long time. <laughs> However, young Julius remained positive. I did most of my studying during the subway trip to and from Uptown City College. Studying in a crowded, noisy New York subway gave me considerable powers of concentration. After spending four years at the City College and graduating with a degree in biology, he started working at the laboratory of industrial hygiene, where he helped devise methods for measuring vitamins in food. In 1946, after the lab received a grant to perform a study on painkillers, Axelrod was asked to consult Dr. Bernard Brody about his research on analgesics. The following encounter had a major impact on Axelrod's career. Working in Brody's laboratory at the Goldwater Memorial Hospital, Axelrod took part in the study of a commonly known analgesic called acetanilide. Their groundbreaking study led to the discovery of acetaminophen, more commonly known under the brand name Tylenol. This chemical compound became one of the most widely used painkillers in the world. During the next six years, Axelrod performed countless experiments and research studies and established himself as one of the leading authorities in the field of biochemical research. In 1952, Axelrod left Brody's team and joined National Institutes of Health, where he started his pioneering research on psychedelic drugs. It was this dive into the world of mind-altering chemicals that made him take notice when hearing of a theory that schizophrenia could be caused by an abnormal metabolism of epinephrine. Better known as adrenaline, this neurotransmitter has traditionally been studied as the hormone involved in regulating visceral functions of the body. Once released into the bloodstream, the so-called survival hormone 
acts as a chemical mediator by conveying the nerve impulses to various organs and plays a major role in the fight or flight response. The theory that adrenaline could be responsible for mental illnesses was compelling to Axelrod, but he was surprised to discover that scientists at the time knew very little about how adrenaline was metabolized. After a series of experiments and a number of disproven theories, Axelrod finally found his enzyme, catechol or methyltransferase, also known by its more convenient acronym, COMT. But something didn't add up. Even though COMT broke down adrenaline in the body, experiments showed that the effects of adrenaline in animals would disappear over time, with or without the presence of COMT. So what was happening to the adrenaline? After tracking radio-labeled adrenaline in cats, Axelrod was surprised to find out that the excess of the chemical was being reabsorbed by sympathetic nerves and stored in their hearts, spleens, and other organs for later use. When those same nerves were stimulated, the neurotransmitter was again released and its effects returned. The sympathetic nerves were acting as a kind of neurotransmitter bank, where adrenaline and other chemicals could be stored until needed. Axelrod had discovered the biological process now known as reuptake. The discovery of reuptake had many immediate applications. Since mental illnesses often involved an impaired regulation of neurotransmitters like adrenaline, Axelrod's discovery of reuptake revolutionized the treatment of diseases such as Parkinson's and schizophrenia. It laid the groundwork for the development of reuptake drugs such as Prozac and Serafin, which are commonly used for the treatment of depression and anxiety disorders. In 1970, Julius Axelrod received a Nobel Prize in Psychology and Medicine for his discoveries concerning the humoral transmitters in the nerve terminals and the mechanism for their storage, release, and inactivation. Back in Bellevue Hospital as a young lab assistant, Julius Axelrod's sympathetic nervous system is reabsorbing the adrenaline his body had released in the accident. As the hormone leaves his bloodstream, his heart rate slows to a normal speed and his breathing relaxes. His body is undergoing the process of reuptake, the discovery of which will earn him his Nobel Prize 30 years later. The adrenaline now sits in wait for the next bout of excitement. And in spite of everything, Julius is eager to get back to his lab because the next time his heart rate goes up, it may be in the thrill of discovery. What is it about crystals that make them so beautiful? Is it their shape, their color? Or maybe it's the way that the light passes through them. But did you know that the way light moves through a crystal turned out to be the key to developing a whole generation of new medicines? This is a story of two CUNY graduates who became Nobel laureates and the invention of direct methods. For as long as history records, crystals have always mesmerized us. From the youngest child to the most powerful kings and queens, something about these strange little rocks can get just about anyone's attention. Scientists, too, had their share of interest, wanting to know what exactly makes them unique from other products of nature. Early on, it was discovered that crystals have a unique structure. On a microscopic level, the atoms and molecules inside crystals are highly organized, forming what's called a crystal lattice, where multiple identical atomic structures can stack together endlessly, fitting like puzzle pieces. Although some of these patterns were well known, taking precise measurements of the atomic structures within crystals proved difficult. For many years, the beautiful symmetries of crystals remained a mystery to scientists. Jerome Carl and Herbert Hauptmann had some symmetries of their own. Both were born in New York City to Jewish immigrants a year apart. Herbert, born in 1917 to a printer and a sales clerk, was a quiet boy who preferred reading to athletic pursuits. When the other boys were out playing baseball, Herbert was at the local library reading philosophy books by Bertrand Russell and math books by Pierre de Fermont, the subject that would become his life's passion. Across the city in Brooklyn, Jerome 
was not so foreign to sports. Born in 1918, the young Jerome enjoyed all kinds of physical activity, from swimming in the packed waters of Coney Island to ice skating in a frozen neighborhood parking lot. But like Herbert, Jerome also discovered an early fascination with science at the local library as he pored over books by the physicist and astronomer James Jeans. To me, it was obvious that there was nothing else to do in this world, he once said. Somehow or other, I would manage to do something science-related. Fueled by their intellectual pursuits, Herbert and Jerome both progressed rapidly through the public school system. And in 1933, the two enrolled at the City College of New York at the ages of 16 and 15. Although their paths came close, it wasn't yet their time to meet. Unbeknownst to one another, Jerome and Herbert both thrived at City College, and the two graduated in 1937. Jerome began studying for his PhD in chemistry at the University of Michigan, where his life was about to move in an exciting new direction. On the first day of his physical chemistry lab, Jerome arrived early and began conducting experiments before class. The student assigned to sit next to him soon appeared, asking how he got in and set it before anybody else. An argument followed, and the two lab mates stopped speaking for several days. After some time, however, chemistry prevailed, and in 1942, two years after their contentious introduction, Jerome Carl and Isabella Lugowski were married. Herbert, meanwhile, continued his love affair with mathematics at Columbia University, where he received his master's degree. When World War II began, he joined the Navy and hastily trained as a weather forecaster and fire marshal in the Pacific Theater. It was a difficult time for Herbert, faced with the destruction of war and nearly losing his life on multiple occasions fighting fires. Herbert grabbed a few precious moments of solace every evening by studying a calculus textbook he had brought from home. Away from the front line, Jerome and Isabella also had their part to play in the war. In 1943, the husband and wife team joined the Manhattan Project, where they worked on isolating and extracting plutonium for the world's first atomic bomb. After the war, Jerome and Isabella both went to work at the Naval Research Laboratory. After some initial work studying electron diffraction in gases, Jerome decided to shift his focus to X-ray crystallography, the study of crystal structures by use of X-rays. It was around this time in 1947 that Herbert Houtman joined the Naval Research Laboratory. After years of parallel but distinct paths, the two scientists finally met one another formally. And using Jerome's initial research as a starting point, they decided to work on crystal structures. Since the early 20th century, scientists had known that X-rays passing through a crystal would be diffracted by the atoms inside of it, and that the pattern of the diffracted X-rays on the other side of the crystal could partially indicate the position of those atoms. But determining the precise position of atoms in three-dimensional space was not an easy task. To do so required three crucial pieces of information. The direction of the diffracted X-rays, the intensity of the rays, and the phase of the rays, that is, how the rays' waves align with one another. While diffraction patterns could tell scientists the direction and intensity of the X-rays, they could not provide the phase. Without this crucial piece of information, the inner structures of crystals remained a mystery. This dilemma was known as the phase problem, and by the 1950s, it had been considered impossible to solve. Jerome and Herbert speculated that the phase problem might be solved by mathematics. With Jerome's background in chemistry and Herbert's in math, they realized they were the perfect team for the job. Building off a recently developed equation that could calculate probable values for phases in diffracted rays, the two scientists created their own formula. With these new calculations, researchers could quickly predict possible structures for a crystal. And if the process was repeated enough times, the observation would eventually match one of the predictions, giving a precise image of the crystal's molecular structure. Yeah! This process came to be known as direct methods, since it only used data collected directly from an experiment and would vastly cut down on the amount of time required to determine a crystal's structure. There was only one problem. The entire process was theoretical, 
since Jerome and Herbert had no X-ray diffraction equipment of their own. And when they released a paper detailing their methods in 1953, the scientific community remained skeptical that it could actually work. For years, their method was largely ignored. Eventually, help came not from afar, but from very near. Jerome's wife and fellow chemistry lover, Isabella, became fed up with the lack of attention paid to direct methods. In order to prove the utility of Jerome and Herbert's technique, Isabella bought a stack of textbooks, taught herself X-ray crystallography, and eventually procured an X-ray diffraction facility for their lab. Now, with equipment of their own, the three scientists turned theory into practice, and direct methods took the science world by storm. Jerome and Herbert's solution to the crystal structure problem went on to be used for countless molecules, and not just those found underground. By applying direct methods to biomolecules, scientists could see how they worked and reacted to one another, allowing them to study and develop new pharmaceuticals for bacterial infections, heart ailments, and malaria, and to gain a much deeper understanding of the natural world. In 1985, Jerome Carl and Herbert Hauptmann were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their outstanding achievements in the development of direct methods and the determination of crystal structures. Although Jerome always felt that Isabella should have shared in their Nobel Prize, she received her share of accolades as well, including the National Medal of Science in 1995 and eight honorary doctorates. When the award was announced, one Nobel judge stated, it is almost impossible to give an example in the field of chemistry where this method is not being used. So, while the inside of a crystal ball may not hold your future, it just might hold the secret to a few more medicines and cancer treatments. Not such a bad fortune now, is it?